All right, so we have Adam Kilcrease doing using the voice of educators to strengthen teacher evaluation and the implications for improved practice. Um, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Kilcrease. I'm a part time instructor for CSU. I'm a full time director of curriculum and instruction, a secondary curriculum and instruction for Russell County Schools in Russell County, Alabama. Uh, before that, I was a building level administrator, uh, district instructional coach, and a secondary teacher. Um, my presentation today, using the voice of educators to strengthen teacher evaluation implications for improved practice, um, is a topic that is very important to me. It was important to me as I was a beginning teacher who really didn't get evaluated much um, as an administrator who is trying to help my teachers grow and now as a system level administrator as I am trying to improve our system. Since I'm a part-time instructor, many people might not know me. So this is just a little bit about me. Um, I, I am a former graduate of CSU. Um, that's how I got my start in education. Um, I was a full-time paramedic working night shift um, while going to college during the day to be a teacher. Um, then I went on um, after I decided I wanted to be an administrator and went to Troy and then ended up getting my PhD in another EDS from Auburn. Um, really interested in student and teacher growth research, uh, disciplinary literacy. Um, I teach um, in the doctoral program, the middle grades program, and the teacher leadership program at CSU. So as we get started today, I want you to think about when you hear the terms public education, what do you think? What first comes to mind? And this is just a summary of what comes to a lot of people's mind based on the information that is being uh, given to the public. And I hope you'll be, I hope you'll be able to hear this. It's like a one minute clip. Um, well, it looks like the U.S. public school system is getting a failing grade. Or find that most U.S. public schools receive a failing grade when ranked on issues including finances, funding, and chance for success. Despite decades of reform attempts and billions of dollars of investments, the American education system badly needs improvement. It's not where it needs to be. There's too many places that aren't doing well. The report card shows only 34% of eighth graders are proficient in math. 9% in science, 33% in reading. Compared to other countries, American students score near the bottom, 21st out of 30 in science, and it's even more bleak in math. They're 25th. Most public schools are still so widely regarded as efficient, and standardized test scores are considered not up to par with the rest of the developed world. So what's going wrong here? Is the U.S. education system broken? Does that sound familiar? My name is Adam Kilgrew. I'm an advocate of public and higher education, and I'm here today to tell you some information that they left out. So that is often what we hear in the uh, public about public education, about the effectiveness of public education and um, sending kids out of public education um, with school choice. Um, options. Um, so that forces me as a building or a district level administrator, um, a research and writer, um, to try to figure out how we can improve that perception of public education. A lot of that has to do with telling our story, telling the good things that are going on in the school, pouring into the teachers that we already have, recruiting new teachers, and achieving results by providing teachers with support. And I would like to recommend that one of the biggest opportunities we have to address those four opportunity areas um, is in the area of teacher evaluation. All right, so that brings us to the problem statement for my research study. And Dr. Loveless actually did a lot of formatting work um, for my work. So this is probably like the 20th time she's heard um, this information. Um, but basically, teacher evaluation across the nation is flawed. And talking to any teacher, um, if you ask their perceptions of the teacher evaluation process, most teachers will say um, something negative about teacher evaluation. 
And that's because current evaluative practices fail to promote teacher growth. They're inconsistent within schools. They're inconsistent across districts and states. And really, administrators, in the grand scheme of things, pretty much base decisions on one 20 minute block of time in a full academic year. So a whole teacher's career is based on one 20 minute observation in a lot of cases. Also policies from legislators and the government centered on teacher evaluation have discouraged teachers, added pressures to teachers and administrators and caused reporting of school data to discourage the public in regards to teacher evaluation. So the purpose of this study was to understand effective teacher evaluation practices by exploring practices of teacher evaluation as described by triads of administrators, teachers, and district level administrators. After nearly 200 years of focus on teacher evaluation, legislators have yet to discover that they are unable to legislate teacher effectiveness. And those demands and pressures from a top-down approach of evaluation affects every aspect of public education. In fact, a review of research stated that 51% of public school teachers who left teaching reported that the manageability of the workload and lack of support from administrators caused their career change. And I suggest when done right, supervision and evaluation can be major players in improving the quality of teaching and learning. And teacher and school, teacher and school success is dependent on five core functions, appraisal, of gauging the quality and level of instruction, affirmation in regards to retaining and developing teachers, improvement, which involves coaching and supporting mediocre teachers, while also providing opportunities for growth of effective teachers. We'll never reach our destination in terms of professional growth, we'll always be on the way. House cleaning, unfortunately that does require dismissing teachers who aren't effective after providing support and quality assurance being able to commit to parents and stakeholders that every child will receive good teaching in every classroom. Schools and students will not improve unless more time is devoted to developing our workforce. And teacher evaluation could be that tool to help teachers, students, and schools improve. After looking at the research, much like teachers' perceptions of teacher evaluation, a lot of the research is focused on the negative aspect of teacher evaluation or the hiring and firing situations um, as a result of teacher evaluation, or in general, the process of teacher evaluation, filling out forms, um, giving feedback to teachers in terms of numbers and vague comments. Um, so there's a gap in research that leaves us with few descriptions of how instructional leaders can increase teacher expertise. So as I reviewed the research, I came up with this conceptual framework that summarized that um, research. These are catalysts based on research for effective teacher evaluation, a shared understanding and purpose of the process. Basically the teacher and the administrator had to be on the same page about the definition of effective teacher evaluation, the purpose and the process, multiple forms of ongoing assessment, dealing with the types of evaluation, whether they're formative or summative, constructive formal and informal feedback related to that dialogue, and a response to evaluation, individual goals and strategies for growth, PD tied to evaluations, and then opportunities for teachers to observe and discuss effective teaching. And all of those things, according to research, will lead to the possible outcomes, professional growth, student growth, and school growth. So the research questions for my study was, what instructional leadership strategies do administrators report as informing their individual approach to teacher evaluation? How do administrators contribute to the professional growth of teachers? How do teachers respond to strategies for teacher evaluation and strategies for professional growth? And how do perceptions of teacher evaluation vary within and across triads of administrators, teachers, and district level administrators? Research has documented what effective evaluation looks like. However, like I said before, there are still negative views of the process. So in this study, I sought out to, to look for effective teacher evaluation processes in school districts and schools. Basically, I was looking for the positive aspects of teacher evaluation that led to teacher growth based on the collaboration between the instructional leader and the teacher.
So hopefully this study exhibits to fill a research, a gap in research by documenting what effective leaders do to increase the expertise of students, because we all know that instructional leadership has a lot uh, to do with improving school co culture, improving collaboration among stakeholders, improving the teacher effectiveness, which all of those will eventually lead to improved student achievement. And the improvement of the teacher evaluation process is not a school system or state issue. It's a national issue. And if we don't respond, teacher evaluation will continue to cause preventable stress and job dissatisfaction, and in turn will not increase the effectiveness of the classroom teacher. So beginning my study, I sought out to review literature back um, 200 years to how teacher evaluation evolved. Um, I looked at policy and legislation that has largely impacted um, public education in the states and teacher evaluation. The current state of teacher evaluation as described um, by research, um, teacher evaluation in Alabama, which has changed a lot, and perceptions of administrators and teachers. So just to be cool, this study actually was conducted in Alabama. Um, I am currently an administrator in Alabama. Um, so that is why the study took place in Alabama. So I used a qualitative research approach with a multiple case study method. I had three cases and each case had one principal, one teacher and one district level administrator. So there were nine participants total. Each participant had four interviews, which equaled to 36 interviews total. And then I did a school observation per case, a classroom observation per class case which resulted in 12 observations total. And then I also analyzed uh, teacher evaluation uh, documents as well. I assumed all my participants answered the questions truthfully and openly without leading questions or prompts. Everything was private and secure. Um, and the information shared by part participants was accurately reported um, in my study, which is currently in publication. Um, through detailed quotes and thick description. So like I said, I interviewed principals in Alabama, teachers in Alabama, and district level administrators in Alabama. But I had to determine how to um, get participants for my study. And because of that, I wanted to do a double no nomination process through expert informants. So I thought to use two very well-known organizations in Alabama, the Alabama Reading Initiative, ARI, and the Alabama Science Math Technology Initiative in Alabama, which is AMSTI. These two organizations are involved with principals and teachers on a daily basis, so they best knew which principals and teachers work well together um, that produced teacher growth. In order for AMSTI and ARI to recommend participants for my study, um, they have to meet certain criteria such as experience, evaluative experience, um, uh, and a reputation for professional growth, and multiple forms of assessment for teacher evaluation. So these are all pseudonyms, the school names and the participant names, but this is kind of a summary of my participants. Um, they had to appear on at least two of the uh, informants lists to be a participant in the study. And it looked, it balanced really well. I ended up getting a primary school, an elementary school, and a high school. So that gave me a, a vast um, area of knowledge related to what's going on in all different types of schools. And as you can see, all of these participants had experience and they have been working together for more than one year, which is needed to produce that growth. At first, I conducted a pilot study with my interview questions and my observations. And because of the length of the interviews, I separated them into four separate interviews, each focused on a different topic, professional background, evaluation procedures, response to evaluation, and then teacher growth and wrap up. Like I said, I did a school observation, a classroom observation, and I really looked for evidence of that relationship between the instructional leader um, and the documents from um, when the, they started working together to when they, um, after the observation problem, uh, process and after the teacher implemented some of the improvement strategies that the principal recommended. So uh, to make sure that my study was valid and the responses that I re uh, 
received and the results of my study were accurate. I um, implemented several validation strategies. Um, I, because I did have bias related to teacher evaluation, I made sure I bracketed that by conducting the pilot, pilot interview. Um, my first year teacher teaching, I wasn't evaluated um, until after the last day of school. That's when I got my first evaluation. So I really um, did have some bias I had to bracket um, to make sure that wasn't displayed in my results. I analyzed and coded each individual transcript, observation, and artifact with themes from the research and themes that just emerged through my study. Um, I added data to my code book and organized information by participant and case and explored data for similarities and differences within each case and then across cases. I've already talked about the uh, double nomination process, um, and it really did validate my study. There were two great cases in my study, but one case, however, which you see highlighted on the screen did not produce great results, but it ended up validating the other two cases, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, all of the administrator participants were male, and remember these were recommended participants from ARI and MSI. All teacher participants were female. Um, all teacher participants were Caucasian. Middle school administrators were not represented or teachers in this study and assistant principals were not represented in this study as well. So let's get to the results and these are not the actual people or the names just for um, illustrative purposes. Let's talk about Way Park High School first. This is case number one. Um, remember each case has a principal, a teacher, and then some type of district level administrator. In this case, it was the superintendent of the school system. So some themes that emerged from the first case um, was that an administrator is a teacher first, relationships matter, and visibility contributes to the perception of support and the importance of clear expectations. This was a great picture of an effective evaluation process. We have two minutes before um, the, the teacher um, did not. Oh, wow. That went by really fast. <laughs> um, this was a great case of um, teacher evaluation. Um, this teacher didn't live in the district. She actually drove an hour and a half to work every day because she loved it so much. She knew, um, she very, very clearly depicted that the administrators poured into her. She wanted to be there. It was a family environment. They weren't just focused on the process of teacher evaluation, but they were really focused on the um, relationship involved in the evaluation process. In this table, you can see the principal's perception compared to the teacher's perception and that they closely align. The, the teacher appreciates evaluation. It's not a gotcha process. And she does receive positive feedback in a constructive way. In the case of Canyon Primary School, this is also another exemplary example of teacher evaluation. Some themes emerged from that case as well. Um, collaboration encourages professional growth. Teachers need quick feedback and the focus is on the students. And there we have the comparison of that as well. Um, the district level participant in this study was one of the most eager participants and it was clear that um, the district led the teacher evaluation process in a growth minded proce uh, process. It was a positive atmosphere, student-focused observations, evidence-based feedback centered on the Alabama quality teacher stand standards, and individual growth collaborative dialogue. And finally, the last case, and I hope I have time to talk about this one because this one was the most challenging case. The teacher liked the principal, but teacher evaluation, in her words, was no good at this school. It really wasn't meant for growth. It was more of a documentation type process where teachers receive numbers as scores and no feedback or support after the teacher evaluation process. It was really a top down approach to teacher evaluation. And although I'm not going to leave this slide up very long, um, this slide depicts the vast difference in opinions um, between the principal and teacher. And consistency Growth comes from collaboration with other teachers, not with the principal. No focus on growth, and she gets the support from the instructional coach. And here are the cross case themes from the cross case analysis. Um, teacher evaluation has a potential to be successful when building relationships and respect is widespread. 
administrators and teachers have a mutual understanding about the purpose and the process of teacher evaluation. Collaboration between all stakeholders and the environment takes place and it's focused on students rather than documenting teacher performance. And you can see the differences in strategies here where case one and case two utilized a lot more instructional leadership strategies than case three. So everything that was going great in case one and two, case three did not have, um, which kind of validated the need for those strategies. Just gonna try to get to one more. Um, So on the left of this figure here um, is the information derived from literature. On, on, on the right side of the screen is the information derived from this multiple case study. And with the research plus the information from this case study comes together, you get what's in the middle. Um, teacher growth is possible when we all work together um, to understand the purpose of effective implementation of teacher evaluation. People are valued over the process. Collaboration between the triad takes place. Administrators are heavily involved in the classrooms and with instruction, and not just on the observation day, when informa informal feedback is given and received, and when professional development and support is tied to evaluation. So the most important part of the evaluation process is the feedback and then the support given as a result of that feedback. I probably passed the two minute mark, didn't I? Yes, but I don't want to cut you off in case you want to get to the end of your presentation. Okay, sure. Just some uh, recommendations for practice. Um, there are some recommend recommendations for educators, principals, teachers, district level administrators, and the Alabama State Department of Education. Um, teachers spend approximately 1,200 hours in a classroom each year alone with their students. And administrators only spend approximately 2% of that time observing each teacher. Ultimately, that means that 98% of a teacher's hard work is not documented. Teachers, principals, and district level administrators should do more to document and pour into the instructive, instructional effectiveness of teachers. And principals must understand that teachers are more than a number. They should spend more time in the classroom and if faculty meetings and the post observation conference is the only time that administration talks about um, teachers and instruction of those teachers, trust will be a major factor affecting desired results. So if principals want to regain the trust of teachers and they should stray away from the top down approaches to leadership and supervision and provide teachers with a more active opportunity in the teacher evaluation process. I highly recommend to all of the teachers that I meet with that they should keep a record of their professional growth and their instructional effectiveness in like a portfolio format. They should collaborate with other teachers and have an active role in the teacher evaluation process and not let it be so evaluator driven. And of course, uh, recommendations for district level administrators match that of principals. Um, they should include teachers in the decision making process, remain visible in the school and put students first and teachers second. Um, Alabama State Department of Education is actually about to go into another change regarding to their teacher evaluation process where they're um, mandating the Elliott tool um, and giving numbers to teachers. Um, they must understand that teachers are more than a number, utilize formative assess assessment instead of only summative assessment. But overall, the fear of people should not be of the administrator. People should be afraid of not growing. And finally, I'm just going to skip through to this last side because I think this is the most important statement of this presentation. Research um, produced the top quote, every principal's most important job is to get good teaching in every classroom. And you can see the negative connotation in that with the word get. Um, and I suggest that we should move more to every principal's most important job is recognizing, encouraging, and modeling positive teaching experiences in every classroom. Thank you for letting me go over a little bit. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you can end the screen share and we'll switch over to the next presenter. We have Dr. Loveless um, doing a pr presentation on thesis and dissertation writing with um, University Support Services. And you can begin whenever you want. Thank you. Um, yeah, my, 
as she said, my name is Jennifer Lovelace. I'm a professor here at Columbus State. Um, and Adam, I, I do vaguely remember now that I've been through that presentation, I do remember your dissertation um, worked on a, a um, of that. Um, but I'm about university supports during thesis and dissertation writing. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges in those phases um, face. There well, seems to be something see? going on with your microphone. Your audio is cutting in and out. Okay. I don't know what. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now, do I need to do something or just talk? Um, I think that was good. Maybe just, uh, I don't know if it's talking slower, or getting a little bit closer to the microphone, um, but whatever it was, it, it worked out. I think there was a problem with a lag. Okay. So one of the things that we some of the things that we'll talk about today will address some of the studies on graduate student retention, particularly for doctoral students and those involved in research and writing as capstone degree requirements, um, such as the thesis or dissertation. We'll also touch on the significance of graduate attrition to not only the student, but the university as a whole. We'll talk about why these rates of attrition are so alarming and why they're harmful to the overall quality of the program and to the university. What researchers have discovered to be key factors in graduate student dropout. Um, for decades, studies have sought to solve this problem with very little success. And the scope of graduate, particularly doctoral attrition, is so broad that it's difficult to study. What researchers have agreed on is that certain factors have increased influence on the process a graduate student is able to make in a very negative way. Some of those factors include supervisor relationship, intrinsic motivation, integration within the discipline and individual characteristics that are uh, non-psychological like those uh, support systems, um, academic preparedness, employment, um, all of those things that impact a student that, that don't have much to do with the institution, but that are still there. And then finally, we'll talk about various ways that are addressing these and practical ways that both students and faculty can implement interventions and supports starting um, today. So the important thing to retention, retention and progression are metrics that are gaining importance in higher undergraduate student retention often gets the most um, because larger. Um, so most of the funding and research is toward undergraduate student retention. But graduate student retention and attrition are often more costly to because of the increased faculty uh, and attention and the resources. Graduate students are more representative of the institution's research agenda and scholarly output. Uh, retaining the caliber, caliber of student is um, of utmost importance to institutions. Graduate student retention is also historically more difficult to track than undergraduate students, given the variation in curricula, degree objectives, and subject matter, as well as many graduate students, traditional students who have built um, and may the program uh, and come back. They may take breaks. They're more likely to be part-time students. Um, it, it may those students and of their true retention, very difficult. Another factor affecting the ability to account for retention is um, programs as compared to on-campus programs. Uh, part-time versus full-time, and institutions define that differently. 
Uh, so it is, it is really difficult for universities to come to a consensus on, on what a, an appropriate master's or doctoral time to degree completion is, um, and then adjust that on part-time or full-time students. Um, most graduate programs do consist largely of non-traditional, increasingly online or part-time students. So what researchers can agree on, good student retention is a significant problem and it has been for decades. Through nearly five decades of research, studies have found a consistent 40 to 60% of doctoral students do not finish their degree. This attrition rate increases online students underrepresented populations and part-time students. Nationally, it, it's estimated, um, again, that 40% particularly those at the doctoral level, uh, will not persist to degree. Um, so why is graduate attrition such a big deal? Um, because much of what we do is determined by the size of our budget. Um, in many cases, our budget is retaining and graduating students consistently university budget to setting a budget and, and counting on funds coming in from other sources. Universities are on the quality of their programs and various metrics, including graduation rates and time. Universities are also held accountable for the amount of financial aid given in comparison with the number of degrees completed. When we have students taking out financial aid but never finishing their degrees, universities are penalized for that. Faculty are promoted based on early publication, including service on thesis and dissertation committee. Students often based on national rankings, alumni reviews, and the availability of student funding. All of these factors are impacted by graduate students. So some of the key factors in the research are is not representative of an academic ability or a lack of academic ability. Many students will progress through the work with problems or about a combination of factors in the path to degree completion. Among the most influential factors is the relationship with our thesis dissertation chair. Uh, many studies have found that the relationship has to propel the student to completion or to hinder the student significantly that they drop out of the program. Researchers have this relationship for years from how advisor and advisory are matched together, personality, how they're selected, um, process uh, for working with an advisor or advisee, how advisors are trained. So research but again, with very little intervention or so any number of factors can play into that relationship. Researchers do all agree that it is one of the primary success or failure for graduate students. Um, other factors include intrinsic factors such as motivation, determination, and drive. They can't necessarily be measured, but perhaps play an even larger role in the student's ability to complete the program. Um, among a myriad of barriers, students the proper motivation and determination will overcome and they'll persist to graduation. Students who are not motivated can be easily derailed by the smallest of setbacks. Um, arguably, one of the most significant factors full degree is the student's reaction to and determination to isolating writing phase of these advantages. Preliminary coursework often provides students with structure and accountability, with a community of peers on whom they can depend and support in for support and encouragement. But once the coursework phase is complete, students often find themselves working independently, struggling to stay motivated in the midst of their isolation. Without weekly accountability, 
of the coursework, students are more likely to fade out of the program during this stage. Again, not because of academic abilities, but because of lack of motivation, support, encouragement, and overall integration into the discipline. So how integrated a student is in the discipline vital role in their ability to persist? Are students involved with other students? Are faculty working with students to publish articles and present at conferences? Are students active in organizations that promote the discipline? In other words, when students finish their coursework, do they still have a reason to come on campus? Do they have a reason to collaborate with their peers and with their faculty? Another key is not necessarily exclusive to graduate students, but is, is certainly more important and more common, is individual characteristics. Many graduate students are older students, traditional, they have families, they have jobs, They're, they may be in school part-time while they work full-time. A lot of students are in the, the stage of life where they're getting married and having children, and they're, they have all Abilities that very easily get away. So the individual characteristics of students is a major factor. Jennifer, in yes. Jennifer, forgive me for interrupting. You are breaking up, and I think it's on your end. I'm not sure what's going on, but we're having difficulty hearing you. I don't, I don't know. Hi. Can you hear me now? I think that's better. I pretty much put my laptop in my face. I, you're still breaking up though a little bit. I don't know what to do. What would you like me to do? Well, just, just move forward. Um, I'm not sure there's much that we can do. Maybe it'll get better. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next Except we can't hear you at all now. <laughs> Yeah, and you've got your video off and I do. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Well, why don't you go through your present your slide presentation and just do the best we can. Hey, if I can add, if I can put my headphones in. I'm sorry, I've got to go back to the main room. If I could find my headphones. Okay. Well, I will go through this presentation as best as possible, and then I, I can also record it and send it to the audience. Um, what we want to do is work through and address these issues. The questions we have to ask is how universities can support students in graduate programs. How can universities support faculty and where can universities implement services to degree completion? The majority of studies of graduate Consider the interaction and of all of these factors. Focused on improving one area, for example, the advisor advising match. What we as a university should be doing is finding ways to address not only these factors, of these factors. Success in graduate programs um, during the isolating writing phrase. Phase. How are we keeping 
and their advisors connected and interacting? What can we do? Can we provide that's motivated and encouraged? Um, how can we train faculty and support faculty? Generally speaking, there's no uniform faculty training. Most faculty have done the hard work of earning the highest degree in their field and have moved into the role of professor, but they've never received or support. That's how to teach even. Having written a dissertation before, you to direct others to do the same. Faculty need help learning these skills and feeling supported in doing it. They're asked to serve roles, most of which come with no direction or training. And universities need to do a better job preparing faculty to lead and mentor students. So here's a brief list of some of the things that universities can do that will have a, a big impact. There are many areas that universities could improve services to that could be expected. Um, so roles for faculty. One of the major areas uh, that faculty trouble or not knowing what we ask a lot of faculty and and that we give them students and to get programs, but they don't necessarily know how to do that. Question. Um, so another way that instructors can provide um, support for teachers is purposeful feedback to students throughout the program. So many times we get students and they are not writing well and we're surprised but they make it through a, a ton of coursework with very little opportunity. Um, so we need to give students purposeful feedback throughout the program and on into the writing phase. Um, and universities as a whole should provide writing support for levels. And know how to write correctly. We live our lives online and emails, Twitter, Facebook. Um, writing is kind of a lost art on a lot of people. So writing should be incorporated in the support system of all universities. Research and development can be that mentoring helps us and faculty navigate unknown territory of supervising graduate work. Whether that mentoring comes from formal mentoring programs or informal, it doesn't really matter. Programs engage in purposeful relationship building among both faculty and students. Uh, another big impact. So recently found that isolating um, the isolation of the Universities through writing groups and communities can encourage students to stay connected even when they're no longer engaged in coursework. Um, and because we're running short on time, I'm going to go through them rather quickly. Faculty in many roles, they're, they're there to put into the discipline, they often serve as advisors. Models for students, official mentors, sometimes official mentors, but also encouragers and trainers. Uh, a lot of the problems that faculty have, not knowing what form what I's to dot or what I's to dot and T's to cross. Um, students don't know to faculty. Um, no. Um, so need to um, we need to do a better job of training faculty and defining their roles. Um, so many universities dedicate resources and faculty um, to training other faculty, particularly junior faculty. We need to teach those faculty how to be more 
effectively, how to mentor more effectively. Um, as I mentioned earlier, writing is not an automatic qualification for direct university to be cognizant of this and train faculty to do what the university Faculty also need to provide purposeful leave a um, hundred page document students can give short sections of their papers. Just one section of a dissertation. Faculty can provide short and actionable and specific um, something that a student can edit. A faculty member can um, feedback throughout the program. Universities should also provide writing support, and that can be through um, writing retreats and seminars, workshops, or boot camps, writing seminars. A lot of universities already, um, but some do not. Some do not make the best use of them. Where Holding a writing retreat this weekend, uh, for example, and, and it's a great students. We just need to make sure that students know about it um, and are able to take advantage of it. Am I out of time now? Um, the chat blinking. Yes, we have about a couple minutes. I didn't know if you wanted to try to get to the end. I know that there was some complications with the technical stuff or if you wanted to move on to questions. Can you hear me fine now? It's It's been going in and out, but yeah, I can hear you fine now. I think it's a, a lag thing, less than a mic thing. Okay. Um, so what I will end up doing is I will record this presentation on my end and send it to you. So that okay. You can put it out there for anyone who missed it. Okay. Um, that'll be excellent because so we'll work. upload all of the presentations to the graduate school okay. YouTube channel and we'll just have the recording that you do for us in place of, of this one. Okay. If that's what you want. That, that will work. Okay. Um, so I will fast forward to um, some practical applications for faculty and students. that can be done immediately or seek a mentor. Does not automatically pick mentors or seek out someone who is doing what you would like to do better. Um, in, and you can definitely, that doesn't have to be an official mentor program. Um, pursue available professional development. Universities spend a lot of money uh, hiring professional development speakers, programs, and resources, will take advantage of them. Learn the process, just without the, your thesis or dissertation. That's not necessarily the university you're currently working. Learn the process and don't let those administrative barriers become barriers for your student for them so that they don't, they can focus research and work to embed writing assignments into your coursework. It's very important that students their program so that they're not surprised at when they get to the end of their program. Students, uh, one of the most practical things students can do is get in a writing group. Um, if you don't already have a writing, uh, writing group, you need to find a group of give you feedback um, that you will not be offended by their uh, You need to read scholarly I like to tell students that if I were to go reader, I would immediately pick up an Australian accent. The same is true when we read. When we read things, we learn to speak the language of really writing. So the more that you read, the more you write. That's small goals. Um, it's hard to 
think of a dissertation as something attainable unless you break it into small goals, daily, weekly goals at first, and then read more. You can always be reading. Actively seek. Will not enjoy what they've read, will not like it, or will be too harsh. But that is the only way this. I'm sorry, you started cutting out almost entirely. And um... I can't hear you at all. I'm sorry. Um, but if you do get that recording into us, we can definitely make sure that that's uploaded. Um, and then um, Dana Griggs added to the chat um, about interest and that's to go for everybody. All of the presentations um, are being recorded throughout the course and over the next couple weeks, we're gonna be uploading them all to the Graduate School YouTube channel and this links will be on our graduate school webpage at CSU. So if there is any session or something that you wanted to check up on or reconnect with the presenter, that will be available for everyone. And um, I apologize that um, you had to deal with the, these technical issues. Um, it's a brave new world that we're all trying to figure out how it's all working. And um, we're gonna take a quick break and get ready for the the last session of the day. Um, well, not the last session, but one of the last sessions of the day and either go back to the main room if you wanna go to a different breakout room or stick around here and we'll just hang out in awkward silence for a bit until the next session's ready to begin. But please give a round of applause, either audio or with the emoji reactions to our presenters today for taking time out of their day to um, share us about their research and some of their the knowledge that they're they've been collecting for us. So thank you guys very much. Kayla. Yes. This is Jim Pace. Um, what uh, I, I present at three twenty three. What um, what breakout room should I be in? Um, let me double check. And would you mind putting me there? Because I, I'm not sure that I'm able to put myself in a different room if, if, okay. if necessary. Okay, 323 you said, let me double check. Right. You Jim will Pace. be in here yeah. with me. So we can oh, okay. just hang around for a little place. bit. And when 320, um, 323, 325 rolls around, um, you should, let me double check here that you do have permission to um, let me find you in our in our okay, participants thanks. list. Um, you may have to go back to the main room temporarily. Amber is having to make people co-hosts um, um, individually so that you'll have the ability to share the screen. So if you want to go and click the little leave room button at the bottom and do leave breakout room, Amber can switch your um, your authorization and then she'll put you back in here. Okay, so just leave the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she should be able to okay. help you out. Right. And see you in a bit. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right.